You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. Hey everyone, and welcome to another awesome episode of Ask Drone You. My name is Paul, and I have the pleasure of having Mr. Kevin Morris from the FAA on the show today. Welcome, Mr. Morris. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thanks, Paul, for having me on again. Oh, I really appreciate having you on. You are a fundamental master of FAA knowledge. <laughs> oh, you're giving me far too much credit. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Kevin, we're here to talk today about um, the Part 107 and how it affects FPV racers. And I know this has been up for debate for a while, but we're seeing more and more FPV racers going out and getting their Part 107 certificate. Why? Because the race coordinators or directors are instructing them to do so. So I want to bring you on the show today to kind of outline why FPV racers do need a Part 107 license and just kind of the story around that. Sure. Um, well, you know, as you know, FPV is, is a pretty big emerging part of the drone community. Um, it, it's not just the racing side of it, but there are other applications that people want to use FPV for as well. Where, where the FAA's interpretation stems from is actually public law 11295 section 336 you know we keep going back to that document that's the congressional mandate that gave us the rules not only for hobby operation but it gave us the also additional instruction of the faa can't promulgate any further rules against hobby operation but what they did in that public law 11295 was they identified what the term model aircraft meant and according to the congressional definition, they list three primary areas. But the one that really applies to our conversation today is number two under that definition, which is a model aircraft must be flown within visual line of sight of the person operating the aircraft. So the way the FAA has always viewed the model operations or the special rule for model aircraft is that you either comply with all provisions of public law 11295, section 336, or you fall under civil aircraft operations, which means part 107. So because the congressional mandate, the congressional law requires operators to maintain visual line of sight. Now this just, it's not a visual observer, it's not your buddy, it's the operator of the unmanned aircraft system. You have to have visual sight if you don't then you're part 107. So that's where the FAA is coming across with our interpretation of what Congress wrote and what it means to maintain visual line of sight. Gotcha, gotcha. I think it's pretty it's pretty simple, but if I understand it too, when you say maintain visual line of sight, part of part 107 says that you have to be able to seek and avoid any obstacles or intrusions or anything that could cause potential harm. I mean, th this directly affects that, correct? Yeah, and I guess in a roundabout way. So there, when, when we look at the public law, the, the Section 336 portion of it, and they talk about maintaining visual line of sight of the person operating vehicle, what we interpret that to mean, and that was published in, uh, the, I believe the title of the document is FAA Interpretation of the Special Rule of, for Model Aircraft. That was issued back in June of 2014. And what we do in that document is we explain how we interpret Congress's requirement that you maintain visual line of sight. And we list three primary areas that obviously it has to be visible at all times to the operator and that you have to use your own natural vision to see it. Now that allows for contact lenses or eyeglasses or corrective lenses, what have you, but it does not allow for binoculars or FPV type viewing devices or an Oculus Rift or something of that nature to view it. Um, so what we're looking at then under the definition of visual line of sight and how we interpret that rule from Congress is if you're doing FPV, you fall under part 107. As soon as you fall under part 107, you as the remote pilot in command or the operator of the unmanned aircraft must comply with all provisions that are applicable to you under part 107. So then going back to what you just brought up, certainly as the remote pilot in command under part 107, you must be able to see and avoid aircraft, take uh, evasive action if necessary, but obviously maintaining an awareness, a situational awareness of that airspace around you. Yeah, I think that's really important. And thank you for clarifying that. It actually makes me think of a question here. So if we had a hobbyist drone pilot, say he was just flying a Phantom, 
but he was using those DJI goggles while flying, he would no longer be following under the model rules either. He would actually have to have a Part 107 license and a visual observer. Is that correct? Well, he would certainly no longer be able to operate under Section 336 if he's wearing first-person view devices. When you start to operate under Part 107, Part 107 actually does allow for first-person view operations. It just requires that you have a visual observer with you because then while you cannot maintain direct visual line of sight of the aircraft, your visual observer can. Awesome. Now, this has been kind of up for, not really up for debate, but it seems like there is a challenger in this whole space here with the AMA. What are they saying? Well, you can go to the AMA website, and uh, without even being a member, you can take a look at uh, some of the information they put out there. And not to get too much into the legal side of it, obviously, I'm not an attorney for Me the FAA. <laughs> if there's some ongoing uh, litigation, which it sounds like there is, uh, I certainly wouldn't want to make any sort of comment on that. But uh, some of the information they put out there um, is is obviously in contrast to what the FAA is saying. So where where this sits right now, at least to my understanding, is that the FAA put out that interpretation of the special rule for model aircraft. That was back in 2000, I believe, uh, 14, June of 2014. That then went out for public comment in the register, and we have somewhere just over 30,000 comments on that. Anytime people make a comment on an interpretation or a rule, the FAA is required to review every single comment. So you can imagine reviewing 30,000 or 33,000 comments. It, it does take a little while. Nonetheless, the interpretation still stands. And from my understanding is that the challenge is in abeyance, which is a legal term for kind of on hold, um, without getting into too much of how that works, because, again, not an attorney, and I wouldn't want to give anybody any legal advice. You certainly don't take it from me, uh, legal advice. But uh, my understanding is that the interpretation still stands and that the AMA is, is at some point challenging this. But until there is some official ruling, the 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 hand down or the the information coming from the FAA is our interpretation stands, which is FPV operations fall under Part 107. Therefore, if you're operating in 107, somebody needs to have that remote pilot certificate, and the UAS must be registered. Which also means that I mean they could have uh, an RPIC with a 107. Um, well, those go hand in hand, standing next to them and say, okay, you're pilot in command and I'll be your visual observer. And that would meet the requirements, correct? Yes. Yes. PAR 107 does not require the person operating the vehicle to be certified as a remote pilot. It just requires that somebody is the remote pilot in command of that UAS while it's being flown under PAR 107. And then we get into the fact that if you are a remote pilot in command, we require you to have a remote pilot certificate you have to pass a knowledge exam, and most people are very familiar with that process now. But the rule is designed so that um, if I didn't have a remote pilot certificate, and you did, Paul, you could be the remote pilot for my first-person view flight. You just have to be in a position as a remote pilot in command to take control of that aircraft at any given time if some unforeseen circumstances arises where you need to take evasive action. So a remote pilot in command can oversee a non-certificated remote pilot flying a UAS under Part 107 using FPV as long as they can immediately take control of that. And that remote pilot in command can be the visual observer as well. They're, they have to be the ones maintaining visual line of sight. Gotcha. So let's say that someone was flying FPV uh, at a race without a Part 107 license or without uh, someone making them the uh, the operator and they have um, a pilot in command essentially who is their 107 which just really quick you could only have one part 107 certificated pilot looking over an operator right you could only have one operator for one RPIC is that correct yeah so if you look at part 107 uh, 107.35 it just states a person may not operate or act as a remote pilot in command or visual observer in the operation of more than one unmanned aircraft at the same time. Gotcha. So whether you're the operator, the RPIC, or the VO, it's one aircraft at a given time. Awesome. Well, thanks for clarifying that. So let's say someone flies FPV. They're not 107. They don't have a 107 licensed operator overseeing uh, their flights. 
what can happen to him? What are, what are the repercussions? Well, it would be the same as anybody operating contrary to part 107. Uh, so anytime you're not in compliance with the rule, technically you'd be in violation of the rule. And if the FAA were made aware of that, we would come out and do our normal investigation that we would for any other potential infraction of part 107. So there's not a special targeting unit that is going to come out just for FPV. We look at part 107 as you are either operating in compliance with it or you're not. Uh, so whether you break one rule or five rules, it's operating in compliance or not operating in compliance with the rule. So the options that the FAA have at that point for potential regulatory violations are the same with any potential regulatory violation. Uh, we would look at it in terms of risk. We look at it in terms of resources and then decide whether or not we can handle that with our compliance philosophy, which would be education or counseling or some sort of additional training or that maybe we would need to go the enforcement route, which could be a civil penalty or a certificate action. Gotcha. So what type of civil penalties, let's just go worst case scenario here. What type of civil penalties are, are we looking at? They vary. Uh, I, and I'll tell you from the inspector level where I kind of live, we don't even determine that dollar amount. Uh, if you were to end up on the wrong side of a, a regulatory violation case or an enforcement case where civil penalties were to come into play, the inspector would then submit that case to an attorney. The attorney looks at our orders and guidance and case law and then comes up with a dollar amount. Um, you can look um, at the history maybe of some FAA certificate or civil penalties and see fines from $2,500 up to uh, sometimes in the millions, depending on the operator and the type of operation. Uh, so it, it varies wildly, but I, I would just caution people to remember it's per operation. So it's not just, well, you did this one rule, you broke it, even though you flew 19 times that day. The FAA would look at that as 19 different violations, even if it were the same one over and over 19 times. So it, when we're talking aviation, which unmanned aircraft are a part of, it's part of that same type of enforcement action where we look at how many times did you fly in violation of that rule and all those times add up. Awesome. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for coming on the show and um, explaining this to everyone because I think it's it's important and a lot of people have been kind of arguing back and forth on you know, which part of the law this applies to. And I think you've done a very good job and a very succinct job of explaining uh, what what does have a real effect. So thank you very much for coming on the show. Yeah, anytime, Paul. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me again. Oh, definitely. And guys, if you're an FPV racer and you're looking to get a Part 107 license, DroneU can definitely help you out. And on top of that, if you want to learn how to build FPV racers from Night Fury, who is on the DRL League and on ESPN, you are in the right place. Just check it out. But again, Kevin, thank you very much. Do really appreciate it. And guys, you're just listening to another awesome episode of Ask DroneU. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.